All right, so thanks everyone for joining. So for this week's seminar, we have Aristoteles from the University of Vienna talking about their recent PRL on incompleteness theorems for observables in general relativity. So Aristoteles is a assistant professor at the Kurt Gödel Research Center with the Faculty of Mathematics at the University of Vienna. And his research interests are close to mathematics rather than physics in the interactions between descriptive set theory and dynamics of large topological groups. So Aristotle, when you're ready, take it away. All right, thanks for having me. Uh, so yeah, we, I, I mean, I suspect that we come from very diverse backgrounds. So feel free to anytime if you want, jump in, inter interrupt me, correct me, uh, or ask a question whenever you feel like. I'll, I'll try to do it in a little bit more pedagogical way rather than presenting results. Uh, but if at some point I fail and you don't follow, just again, stop me and ask a question. So this uh, is a, a joint work uh, with uh, Marius Christodoulou from uh, Aikoki here in Vienna and George, George Sparling from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Marius just joined also. Hi, Marius. Uh, right, and started, Marius is a very good friend from um, the undergrad essentially. And um, we start talking about this problem because uh, as you said, I, I work with uh, dynamics of uh, large topological groups. And one of these groups is the diffeomorphism group of a manifold. And there is an obvious action of this uh, group that I'm, I'm going to talk about today, the action on all Lorentzian metrics. And then later I got to meet uh, George uh, at this cafe in Pittsburgh and uh, well, he brought the last piece of the puzzle because uh, he, he he's an expert in, on plane waves and hopefully I'll, I'll explain that later, right? So let me start uh, by reviewing briefly uh, Lorentzian manifolds, right? And if I want to be very, very general and very, very abstract, and I will not be, I promise, but just uh, for this first slide, uh, someone, well, one way of, of thinking in complete generality Lorentzian manifolds is as follows, you have some uh, manifold M, right? And this uh, manifold M uh, at its point P, it has a tangent plane, right? And uh, a Lorentzian metric, what does it do? do? It, it chooses, it chooses for it, each of these tangent planes, it chooses an inner, an inner product. So if you have two vectors here in the tangent plane, you know what the inner product is. Now this inner product is a weird inner product because it has this uh, signature here. Uh, so this means that there are vectors that are not zero, but still they may get uh, they may get uh, a norm zero. And you know you know better than me how these things look like. Uh, sorry, let me see if I can clean here. Right, you know you know better than me how this looks like. This weird inner products create these sort of light cones. Um, now. I will be much more concrete in this talk. So for me, let's fix uh, a specific manifold, R4, to make our lives easier. Uh, and from now on, uh, we'll work on this on mostly, mostly we'll work on, on this manifold. Mostly we'll work on this manifold. So in that case, we can really uh, re write a Lorentzian metric in a much more co concrete fashion. Basically, a metric is just a smooth map from R4 to R4 cross 4. Uh, that on each point on R4, you associate uh, this uh, four by four matrix that uh, is symmetric and it has uh, one negative and three positive eigenvalues. That's all it is. And this precisely tells you what is the, this, uh, this weird inner product uh, on its tangent plane. Right. Now, I'll use often this terminology instead of talking about Lorentzian metrics, I'll talk about space times. So this is a tautology, a space time is really a Lorentzian metric. There's nothing there, but, but this terminology, I use it because I want to emphasize something, right? So if, if you give me a Lorentzian metric, I can extract from it various quantities, like for example, uh, the Ricci tensor uh, or the Ricci scalar. And I can write down this, uh, this well, I can, I can definitely write down, write down this left-hand side and compute it, right? And this, well, okay, and, and I'll bring this on the other side if I want. And this will give me a stress energy tensor. So think of these uh, equations as basically you feed it a machine, you feed it a Lorentzian, uh, Lorentzian uh, metric, and it spits out something like a stress energy tensor. Now, 
when I'll be talking about space times, often what we may want to do is we may want to fix some uh, collection of stress energy tensors, which we deem uh, physically relevant and consider only those space times that if you fit them in this machine, this stress energy tensor will be physical enough, right? But of course, this is a point of uh, contest, like different people have, you know, different agendas or maybe different interests and what, whatever, what uh, is uh, physically relevant for, for one person may not be physically relevant for another. Uh, and maybe a good example to give at this point, uh, an, an example that also, uh, well, it's a little bit, uh, you know, dear for logicians is the following example, right? So here's what you may want to do. What you may want to do is you may want to create a, a space time that it has a closed time like curves, right? So this means that, oh, well, for example, if this talk, if this talk uh, that I'm giving now takes place within this universe, it's part, it's part, of, the, it's part of the universe, and, and you are just an observer going around this uh, close time like uh, curve, you, if you miss the first part of the talk, you can see it again and again as many times as you wish, right? And in order to construct uh, such, a, such a, one way to construct uh, such a space time with a close time like curves is to use, to use um, stress, stress energy tensors that are very, very well tuned. You add uh, some uh, rotating dust in the universe, and for this rotating dust, you have to choose very specifically a negative cosmological constant. So certain things cancel out, but what remains is this sort of uh, closed time-like curves. Uh, is this, is this a, a physically relevant uh, uh, energy tensor? I don't know, it depends on the discussion. However, let me just say uh, that this is a famous space time that was invented by uh, Gedel and was uh, gifted to Einstein on his birthday. Uh, and uh, so, you know, Gendel was obsessed with uh, what, whether, you know, the universe we live in can actually look like something like that, may have close time like curves. Uh, and observational data are compatible with uh, uh, row rates of rotation. But, uh, but back uh, during Gendel's life, the quality of these observations were not, were not as good. Uh, and they kept improving, uh, well, until Gettel's death. But Gettel kept ask, asking the question to astronomers, is the universe rotating yet? This was the way of uh, him, uh, uh, well, <laughs> how to say, uh, interacting with uh, astronomers, um, expecting for them to observe uh, some rotation that never came as a... Um, Okay, uh, so okay, so this is like a very brief background on uh, on space times. Uh, what I want to discuss a little bit is uh, observables. Uh, and uh, let me ask with a follow. Uh, let me start with the following uh, uh, question, right? Let's say I give you the following two uh, metrics, right? Have the Chimney new and this T tilde uh, rho sigma, and. Of course, you, you can you can inspect them and see they are different. But the question is, do they really represent the same the same geometry, the same space time? What does this mean? Well, it, they may represent exactly the same geometry, just in a different coordinate system. So two space times, two metrics like this, uh, represent the same geometry if they are diffeomorphic. And I'll be using this notation. This means you can find a smooth change of coordinates that satisfies uh, this equation. This tells you basically that, uh, you know, uh, Jim Nunu is the push forward of uh, G tilde rho sigma under a smooth series of coordinates. This is what it says, right? But the point here is that, well, okay, actually let me make the point in the next slide, right? So again, the question is, I give you these two, two metrics. Can you, can you find a way to decide whether they are they represent the same space time? How difficult that is? Well, it turns out that these two, these two uh, space times, well, these, these two metrics represent exactly the same space time, the same uh, geometry. Uh, so, of course, it's difficult to know if I don't give you what, what the, the correct or what, what is, what is the, the change of coordinates uh, that uh, allows you to see that. So if I give you this change of coordinates, then you can do the computations. You can do the computations, you can compute the differentials, you can square them and then plug them here. And realize that basically that, uh, you know, uh, th 
this thing transforms into that. Right. But but uh, it's what, the, what what I want to what the point I'm trying to make here is that it's very easy to confirm that these two things, that these two things are represent the same space time. If I give you this witness, if I give you the smooth change of coordinates, but if I don't give you that, then you have to be searching for all possible smooth change of coordinates to see if these things will match up and the collection of all smooth change of coordinates is some sort of infinite dimensional space so it is very difficult to if you don't know if you do not know in which corner to look it's very difficult to find this witness the point i'm making is that this problem the problem of deciding whether two metrics are represent the same space time it's a very complicated problem and this talk is about the complexity of this problem in a sense this is what it is about so let me put uh, let me rephrase this problem in the context of observables Right. So what I'll be do doing here, I'll be looking at a collection of space times, fix any collection of space times, collection of space times that you, you know, th think are physically relevant. Right. And consider this equivalence relation on S. So, for example, here I have uh, some G nu nu and here maybe I have some uh, G rho sigma tilde. And if they are in the same orbit, if they're in the same orbit, then uh, they are diffeomorphic. This is what this means. Right. So it's 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 the Fermortis morbid represents the same geometry. Right. And an observable, an observable is a function. So here I'll be very abstract in the beginning. So it, it's a function on some set R. So R is a set for now, nothing else. But this function has to be the Fermortis univariant. So if I give you if I give you two metrics that are diffeomorphic, they have to map to the same value. Right. This tells you basically that this function is physical, that, the, that it measures something that comes from the geometry and it's not an artifact of the coordinate system. Right. So, so what it measures is not an artifact of the coordinate system, but something that depends only on the geometry. And now maybe an informal, an informal way to put uh, into words uh, the problem of observables is the following. Basically, what you're trying to do is you're trying to give a, given given this collection given this collection s what you're trying to do is you're trying to find a, a, a useful find find a family of useful useful observables and in fact ideally you would like to find observables for very very large collections of space times all all space times that you need for your theory all right uh, so this useful of course is not a, it's not a formal uh, term here, uh, but here's one way to formalize uh, usefulness. One thing you may want to do is you want to be able to classify. You may want to use 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 this observable to classify space times. So so an observable is complete if this implication can be strengthened to an infinite leaf. Another way of thinking about this is the following. Uh, Let's say here is R, and here's your, your observable F. From the mere fact that it's an observable, it means that if I give you two points that are equivalent, they have to map to the same point. However, this, this definition here, being an observable, potentially tells you that if you look at this point and look at spring maps, maybe you, you may have many, 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 many orbits that map to the same point. Well, if this happens, then the observable is not complete. So, so an observable is complete if uh, each point here, when you look at spring maps, it corresponds to a single orbit, a single orbit. So such an observable, a like complete observable, completely classifies, completely captures all the all the geometric uh, data that lie in in specific uh, uh, physical space time, right? Uh, so. So one way to think about uh, usefulness is exactly that you have enough observables to classify completely all the geometries represented in S. Um, now, a point that I'll come back later to is uh, if it's easy to construct, it's easy to construct complete observables. If this R, if this R here, you allow it to be very, very abstract. One thing, for example, that you can do, one thing, one thing you can do, for example, Uh, one thing you can do is you can take the space here, this space here, to be the collection S and mod out by 
diff. So this is like an abstract set. If you take this to be R, it's an abstract set. This is the quotient space. Trivially, every orbit maps to a single to a single point here. However, this set this set is not very useful to do any computations. It's not useful to do any computations. So the question, what we'll try to do, is we'll try to see if there are complete observables when this R, this R here, is much, much more concrete. It's, for example, the reals. So R, I use R here for range, but I also use it for the reals. Or, or maybe you want to have many, many different measurements. So maybe you need, I don't know, countably many measurements. So maybe this R will be the reals to the natural numbers, the reals to the end. You have countably many measurements, and all this together, Form a complete observable, right? Um, now, it's called the, the problem of observables uh, for a reason. Uh, and let me maybe a little bit more historical uh, approach here. So going all, all the way back to the 50s, really here, uh, Bergman and uh, Yanis define observables as functions which are invariant with respect to coordinate transformations. This is exactly what, what uh, I was saying in the previous slide. But, okay, you define this, and the moment you define it, you cannot do much more. You cannot do much more. Already, later in Bergman's life, you see here, you know, uh, well, it says that uh, the, the program aiming for the identification and systematic exploitation of observables has been underway for many years, but uh, its execution has uh, hampered by profound technical difficulties which have not uh, been uh, overcome completely, right? And, and okay, this, this uh, sort of uh, pessimist uh, uh, remark, or maybe this, this remark about uh, the difficulties uh, kept persisting, kept persisting. Uh, you can see here, in a, uh, well, later in 2001, uh, in a paper of uh, Smalling, you know, presently we can give a formal characterization of observables, like in the previous slide, I can, I can, I can define this, uh, what does it mean to be invariant, for example, formally. But we're actually not able to explicitly construct examples of such quantities. It's very difficult to construct uh, such uh, explicit quantities. And if, even later, here is like a, a more pessimist uh, remark, is that probably observables for full generality, well, almost certainly, almost certainly do not exist. However, I want to emphasize something. Uh, this, there is this parenthesis here, without any speci special um, Asymptotic symmetry or matter content. So, so this parenthesis here, you may take it as saying that if you restrict, if you restrict S, if you restrict S, so it contains space times that are very specific. So they have uh, a lot of symmetries, or the space times uh, have uh, some uh, uh, matter, some generic matter in, inside them. Then you may be able to construct complete observables. And maybe let me, it's, maybe it's a good time to give you some examples. And this is what the next slide is about. Right. So here are three three different situations where you actually have uh, uh, several useful observables. Sometimes even complete. Right. So there is a quantity here uh, called Komar mass. So what you do is that you start with a manifold, and th there are some quantities here that you extract from from the metric, and this these are some vectors uh, that uh, you can isolate. You can uh, isolate from the assumption that uh, the the, time, the space time that you're looking at are static. So, okay, let me let me, let me backtrack a little bit. If if here if if the collection S that you are trying to find observables consists only of uh, static space times, then for its uh, gene you knew you can associate you can associate you can find this sort of killing vectors here, and then you can form this integral and integrate over the entire manifold, and this gives you some quantity like the total mass. It turns out that if S consists entirely of static space times, this is actually a complete observable on the collection of uh, Schwarzschild solutions. So basically, Schwarzschild solutions, uh, um, black holes of this very, very simple form, can be completely classified by the mass. So, so if, if, you cared only, if you cared only about the Schwarzschild solutions, then you have complete observables. This is the, the, the Komar mass associated to them. Right. However, maybe in S you want to include much more space times. There are much more geometries that you want to consider, and then maybe you start. Maybe maybe then Komar mass is not enough to classify them, and you may be hoping to add some more geometric data, some more integrals, maybe to capture more and more and more quantities that are geometric. 
Can I yeah, jump in but... with a with a brief question? Yeah. Um, so has there been any discussion about whether these issues are alleviated in linearized gravity? Like as in um in the linearized regime, there might be complete so, uh, so I will tell you from uh, the proofs. Uh, that we have later on, and this is, I think, a remark that also Mario's uh, Mario's. Was, All right, how do you uh, want to do it? You want to switch off? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and this is uh, also uh, something that uh, Mario's was uh, uh, trying to. Uh, in, in, no, no, no. Oh, sorry, sorry Nick, Nick, Nick. I think your um mic's unmuted. <laughs> And this, this is also a direction that Marius wanted to pursue. Uh, I, I think from our proof will come that even in the linearized regime, uh, there are some difficulties. The same okay. difficulties as, he, as, as I'm going to present. Because the proofs later will come from this sort of plane waves. And you still have yeah, waves yeah. in the linearized regime. So, so let's keep this question uh, later when I arrive to plane waves. But, okay, uh, sounds good. Yeah. I, mean, I can just briefly comment on this to say that uh, uh, Aristotelian is a mathematician. He's very, very precise. So he's not sure that uh, the theorems go through because you need good definitions and so on. And you need to check it. It seems that they might go through, but I mean, the, the proofs that he has in the paper are very um, precise. And so uh, one would have to sit down and see if. Uh, one can prove these theorems for um, the plane waves of uh, linearized gravity, but it can be sad because of the approximations and so on. I see. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Um, right. Yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting uh, direction. Uh, but Maria is correct. We don't have any proofs yet. It seems the intuition says that something like that should work, but of course, one needs to sit down and actually. Uh, compute these things. Uh, I'll, I'll explain later the tools that you need to do that. So, and you are invited to try. Um, right. And similarly, in other contexts, you have uh, useful observables. So, if you if if the collection S consists only of asymptotically flat space times, then you have what the so-called ADM observables that are certain integrals like this over the entire manifold. Uh, these ADM observables do not complete, they're not, if you combine them, there are, I don't remember, there's a number of them, like 10 observables or something like that. Uh, if you combine them in a single observable, still this is not complete for the asymptotically flat space times, meaning you cannot, they cannot, they do not completely classify all geometries there. Uh, however, they're still useful, you can do some things with them, right? And finally, you can work with space times where you have a, a stress energy in tensor. Uh, which describes a uh, generic dust. Then all these particles that you have in the space time, you can use them to create relational observables. So, so somehow use this generic dust dust to say, you know, how close you are in a certain uh, part of the universe that it's not anywhere else. And using this uh, uniqueness of this dust in a specific place, sort of recover coordinates back. So that's why I call them coordinate-like observables. Basically, use the dust to recover the coordinates geometrically. Uh, so in these situations, you these are these are three examples where you have uh, uh, a lot of observables. Sometimes not enough to classify everything, but still you can do some physics using them. But uh, it turns out that uh, if you remove these specific assumptions about asymptotically flat or working with uh, static space times or generic tasks, then it turns out that the intuition coming from the previous slide, all this pessimism, the pessimism from the previous slide, actually it can be articulated into a formal theorem. And this is the main theorem I want to talk about. And I don't know why it's, uh, it's not, sorry. Something's and, and this is the theorem I want to talk about, the main theorem. In a nutshell, the theorem, I'm going to present it now, but, but in a nutshell, this tells you that if, if S is rich enough, if you include a, enough examples of different geometries inside, and I'll, I'll make more precise what this means enough, uh, if this is rich enough, then uh, you cannot really have uh, complete observables which are uh, defined using formulas that you can use to compute things. You cannot use analysis to write down 
you don't have uh, formulas coming from analysis and therefore allowing you to compute things uh, that, that describe complete observables. In other words, in the same way that, you know, in ancient geometry, if I give you a cube and, and I give you the length of the cube and I ask you, what is the length, what length do you need to use to double the volume of the cube? This is something that you cannot construct using a trait and a compass. In the same way, these observables cannot be constructed, complete observables cannot be constructed using now, not just stated and compounds, but uh, even uh, taking limits of an algebra. So, so I think of analysis as start with polynomials and then you take pointwise limits. I'll, I'll explain this a little bit later, right? The formal statement, the formal statement is the following. And there are here some terms that I have not explained and the rest of the talk will be explaining these things, right? So, so but let me briefly say, so if, if a, If S is rich enough, then you cannot find any Polish observable that is both complete and Borel definable. So allow me, allow me very briefly here to uh, explain these terms involved, but uh, later I'll do it formally also. Re recall here you have this family S and, and it's split into this diffeomorphism orbits. And here we had this, back then we had this set R and we were considering observables like that, F, and, and um, remember, completeness, completeness means that uh, uh, two points, two metrics are uh, diffeomorphic if and only if they map to the same, the same uh, point in R. So completeness, we have defined what it is, right? So what uh, remains is Polish and Borel definable, right? So remember, I told you before that if you don't assume anything about this R, you don't assume anything about this R, if this R is just a set, then you trivially have complete observables because you can take this R, you can take this R to be just S, the quotient space with the diff. This is an abstract space that is not, not useful. It's just, okay, it's a set. So if you do set theory, maybe you're happy. You have a set that does the job, but it's not really useful for computing things, right? So Paul is here, Paul is here, is an assumption that tells you that you are not allowing situations like that. This R has to be concrete enough. It has to be the reals, or it has to be the reals to the N, or more generally, it has to be a poly space. R has to be a poly space. A poly space, I'll define in the next slide what it is. It is a, a nice topological space, a topological space that behaves like the reals. It is separable and completely metrizable. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll explain in the next slide, right? So, so this, this polishness is an assumption about, about the, the range. Borel definability is an assumption about, about this function, that this function should be, you should be able to write down an explicit formula, right? So this theorem tells you that if the collection of space times is rich enough, and you're looking at observables that take values in a nice space, like in a concrete space, a space that uh, looks a little bit like the reals, and you want this, uh, this, this additionally, you want this uh, map to be definable, to be Borel definable, to be definable in the sense of analysis, then you will fail. You cannot find complete observable this on a, on a poly space that it is uh, also uh, Borel definable. Um, Aristo, can yeah, I please what you said? I mean, for the physicists, I mean, to say it negatively, it's more clear maybe because the point is that. Uh, um, if you want complete observables, you will either need to um, make your space of solutions to be not Polish, or um, these observables to not be Borel definable. And that essentially takes you out of any, of, out of all the mathematics that you use in physics. Right, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a good way of saying it. Um... All right, so what I need to do now is to, I want to, you know, present to you some descriptive set theory in at least enough to get some intuition about what this polishness assumption is and what this Borel definability assumption is, right? So, okay, a poly space, it's, you can think of it as the most tame incarnation of an uncountable set. You can think of it as, as a, a, the reals, essentially, but a reals stripped out of the, um, I'd say, uh, well, actually, let me give you an example. So a poly, a poly space, okay, the definition of a poly space is a, a separable and completely metrizable topological space. 
And here are some examples. Maybe using examples, you can you can see better what I mean. Here are examples of polyspaces. You can look at the reals. You can look at infinitely many the count the countable fold product of the reals. So think of this as maybe you want to have countably many different measurements, countably many different integrals, for example. Uh, a separable Hilbert space is a polyspace, and a, a, a space that will be important for us. If I give you two manifolds here, two separable manifolds, and you look at all smooth maps from uh, this manifold to this manifold, this is a polyspace. The collection of all smooth maps is a polyspace. If you put the right topology on it, and the topology here is what is known as the uh, C infinity compact open topology. L let me not go into, into that right now, but it's a, a canonical topology that you can place on this and make it make it a polyspace. Right? Polysness tells you basically that you can control. Despite the fact that this set is uncountable, you can easily control control it from the finite. What do I mean by that? The reals, the reals, each point you can approximate it using rationals. Rationals, the rationals is a list. It's a list, it's it's a countable set. So you can go arbitrarily close to a real using going by going arbitrarily further up in this list of rationals somehow. The more, the more, the more and more finitely many rationals you're allowed to take, the closer and the closer you get to this, uh, to any point you want. So this having this tight control by approximations from the finite to the uncountable, this is what the polyspaces are for. This is why we study them in, in logic. These, these are places where you can study definability uh, and definability behaves nicely. So descriptive set theory comes into two periods, let's say. And this all periods overlap, like back uh, back in the uh, you know in the 1900s. Uh, what what was happening back then? Well, there was uh, this formalization of measure. Lebesgue, Borel, and Lebesgue uh, showed up, and uh, Lebesgue uh, defined the Lebesgue measure, and then they realized that there are some subsets of the reals that are very pathological. You cannot cannot associate; they are not measurable. You cannot cannot associate them uh, well defined measure. Uh, and people back then start st studying, started to study subsets of the reals or of any polyspace, let's say, which are definable enough. And it turns out if these subsets are definable enough, then measure is well defined on them. To construct, to construct pathological sets, because sets uh, where measure is not defined, well defined, it doesn't behave well, you somehow, you, have, you cannot do it very constructively. You have to appeal to the axiom of choice in a certain sense. Right. And later, later, from the 1950s and later on, uh, we move to invariant descriptive set theory. So in invariant descriptive set theory, so classical descriptive set theory studied subsets, invariant descriptive set theory studies complexity of quotients. And this is very, it's pertinent for the discussion we have here, because we were trying to understand this quotient of uh, space-times uh, mod uh, the morphism. Um, and uh, perhaps what may, may be of interest to some of you, the, the 1950s, what happened in the 1950s and uh, led to this? In fact, analysts uh, start being interested in classifying unitary representations of uh, countable groups, locally compact groups, uh, infinite dimensional such representations, and try to classify them up to unitary equivalents. And they realized that this uh, quotient space is very, very complicated. It's very complicated. Right. So, okay, I, I do discuss a little bit about polyspaces. Let me briefly also tell you what is a Borel map. So, okay, a Borel subset of a polyspace is any subset that, that uh, is contained in the following family, the family of Borel sets. What is this family? This family contains the topology, the open sets, and it's the least such family that it's closed under complements, countable units, and intersections. Right. You can think of this as if I give you if I give you all the topology, meaning the open sets, and I give you a machine that can compute uh, negations, countable ends. So you have countable logic gates and countable ors. Then you can generate all Borel sets, right? And a function from a polyspace to a polyspace is Borel if it's definable in this sense. Preimages of open sets are not open. This would be continuous. Preimages of open sets are Borel. This is usually how people define uh, Borel, Borel maps, but the, the way I personally like to define this, uh, this Borel maps is as follows. This, this is an equivalent definition, which this equivalent definition makes it more clear why I think of Borel maps as everything that you can define using uh, analysis. 
right? So a function from a polyspace to a polyspace is Borel. If it's contained in the following family, this family is the smallest family that contains all, all continuous maps, and it's closed under point-wise limits. So if you have a sequence in the family, a sequence of Borel maps, a sequence of maps that you already have established that they are Borel, and it happens that this family, this, uh, this sequence has a point, for every point, the, the limit f and x exists, then, this, uh, then there is a function in this family. Well, the, the associated function, the limit function, the point-wise limit of, of the sequence is in the family as well. And uh, here's an, a, a more concrete example to have in mind. So think of, our, of the following function, the function from R to R, which I define with this you know, silly formula here. So I look at these cosines, it doesn't matter what, what uh, just, this is just an example, okay? So these are some cosines and I have, uh, I'm, I'm taking first the limit on this exponent and then I take the limit here in the frequency. It turns out that this, that this, uh, this, uh, this F is nothing else than the characteristic map of the, of the rationals. So it takes, it is, it's totally discontinuous. It takes two values, it takes zero and one, one on the rationals and zero, uh, on the irrationals or vice versa zero on the zero on the rationals well i'll leave it to you i don't remember i think it takes i think it takes zero on the irrationals and uh, one on the rationals right so you can you can sort of this highly discontinuous function still it is bo it is borel because it is the point wise limit i had to take two limits of a continuous of a, of a continuous sequence a sequence of continuous maps <clears throat> All right, so here's the fun, final uh, sort of technical part that we need, and uh, I'll try to be brief. So there is, there is this, uh, let me open it up here. There is this uh, folklore theorem. It tells you that if you have, if you have let's say, X is a Polish space, and you have a Polish group, a Polish group is a, a topological group with a Polish topology, and this acts continuously on the, on the Polish space, so you have these orbits here. If it happens, if it happens that, uh, there is a dense orbit. So if you can find a, a point here whose orbit goes all around and visits all open sets, and somehow each orbit is small enough, it's what we say meager. So, uh, forget what this means. Think of this as saying that it is very, very small. It's, it's very thin orbit. Then we call this action generically ergodic, right? And there's a folklore theorem that tells you that, uh, sorry, this is G here. Uh, and this is G here, this is G here. It tells you that uh, that if you have a space, a G space here, so you have an uh, you have a, an action of a polyspace on uh, an action of a polish group on a polyspace, and you have a map uh, on Y, uh, and this map it is an observable, and it is Borel, then it it cannot it cannot be complete, it cannot be complete. So there is no Borel map that makes this if and only if work. Right. So, so this is this is like an old uh, folklore theorem, and this is what we are hoping to use to prove uh, uh, this incompleteness for for uh, for space times. So, the first thing you you may want to do is maybe what you want to do is you want to establish that the diffeomorphism group acting on all Lorentzian metrics is generically ergodic. But this is quite difficult to do. The second thing you could do is you could start with an example that you already know it's generically ergodic, and shoot it in space times and this is precisely what this example is used for so maybe you're familiar with the Bernoulli shift of the of z so think of it this way this space here is all by infinite sequences of zeros and ones so an element an element let's say alpha inside here think of it as an infinite by infinite string of zeros and ones so you have zero one one zero zero etc and if you have if you have an, an alpha like that and a beta like that, these two things are, are equivalent. If if one is the shift of the other, you can shift one to the other, uh, then this these are equivalent. Now it turns out, so, so this is an action of the integers, right? And it turns out that this uh, action is generically ergodic. It takes a little bit of time to see that. It's not very difficult, but uh, there is a little a little observation you need to do to see to see how to construct an, a bi-infinite sequence that as you shift it around, as you shift it around, 
it's it's dense inside the space space of all sequences but you can do it so this sort of density this sort of density of the orbits is what uh, makes it very difficult to classify these spaces so so now what is the goal the goal is to the final thing i need to do is to tell you what are these rich families so let me go back to this uh, to this theorem so the theorem said that if if the collection of space times is rich enough then you cannot find a poles observable that is both complete and uh, and borel right and maybe yeah let me let me forget about this remark for a bit uh, so 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 what is rich formally like it, from what I said in the previous slide, one way to make this work is to define rich as follows. If you can shoot the complexity of the Bernoulli shift, you can shoot, if you can shoot the complexity of the Bernoulli shift inside the, uh, the, the collection of space times, so what do you want to do? You have this pathological, pathological uh, orbit space of Z, and you have here your space times S. What you want to do is, so here is the diffeomorphism group that is acting. Here is Z is acting on. Uh, on uh, zero one, let's see. What you want to do is you want to basically take this uh, by infinite sequences and for each by infinite sequence alpha, cook up some uh, metric, the mu nu associated to alpha, in a way that uh, alpha and beta are in the same orbits, if and only if the associated uh, metrics are diffeomorphic. If you achieve that, then you essentially you are showing that the complexity lying inside here is, is also inside the collection of space times. And this is a strategy for proving, for proving this theorem. So I don't have much more time. Um, we'll start a little bit late, so maybe I'll take three more minutes uh, to wrap up. Um, right? So, so here's one way to do that. So if you don't care, if you don't care, if you don't care about the um, if you don't care about uh, weird stress energy tensors, right? So if, how to say, it? one way to make one way to make a, a family of space times reads is to allow this family to contain weird or very complicated uh, stress energy tensors. And here's one way to do that: you can use the family of uh, cosmological space times, this so-called the Friedman, uh, Lemaitre, Robertson, uh, Walker matrix, and this uh, this infinite sequences of zeros and ones which are pathological in their shift use them to cook up cook up uh, uh, cosmological space times that asymptotically follow this zero and one pattern by oscillating sometimes sometimes the you know the space the space like volume increases and sometimes it decreases that's one way to do it okay that's interesting but it's maybe Maybe one may have doubts whether this, uh, well, maybe one can say that, okay, here basically what you did is that you, the whole complexity, you encode it already on the stress energy tensor. Is there a way to do that without affecting the stress energy tensor? And maybe the interesting thing, they, they, well, the main theorem of the paper is actually you can already do it for vacuum solutions. So the problem, the problem of observables. The problem is that you cannot find the uh, uh, complete and borrowed definable observables uh, already lies in, in the local degrees of freedom in the background theory of in four dimensions. And another way of saying that is, uh, it turns out that the family of all vacuum solutions in R4 is rich. Meaning you can, you can do the same trick, you can code this Bernoulli shift inside them. Um, right? And the way you do that, like one way to do that, I guess, the way we do it in the paper is you, we use uh, plane waves. Uh, plane waves are very, very important, very important uh, vacuum solutions. Uh, they are not as well known as they should, I think. Uh, so, so plane waves you usually write them. You usually write them in uh, this chord. That's where this is um, light-like and this is light-like, right? And they look a little bit like this. Uh, they look like this, where this here uh, satisfies this equation. Uh, and and the idea the idea is so this is this uh, H that I had in the previous slide. 
the idea is to consider functions that look like that. And this uh, W alpha is a smooth map from R to R that codes this uh, zero ones. This is the idea. Now, you need to solve this reduction and showing that when two sequences of zeros and ones are shift of one another, then the associated matrix are diffeomorphic. This is easy. But to show the converse, it's actually quite difficult. And it relies on analyzing all the killing vector fields of uh, these plane waves, which, well, you have, you have to go to the literature and search, and there has been a lot of work that we use from these authors here. Um, OK, that's all I had to say. Maybe one thing, one thing that it's important for me, because this is like a currently what I'm pursuing, um, is perhaps, well, yeah, maybe, maybe one more minute to say the following thing, is that invariant discrete set theory, as I said, studies quotients, studies how complicated quotients are. So the previous theorem established that, uh, um, established that, uh, um, let's say even vacuum solutions, up to diffeomorphism, is a complicated quotient, right? But there is a whole theory of quotients. So basically we showed that it is enough complex that you, you cannot reduce it, let's say, to, to equality on a poly space. But maybe you can reduce it to some relatively complex, but not too complex, equivalence relation on some poly space. So, so the, the incompleteness theorems that we were discussing about were taking this to be some poly space with, with equality. But what you can do instead is you can take some poly space together with an equivalence relation that is important to you. For example, this could be a collection of unitary representations of some algebra, and this may be unitary equivalence. So the question may become, take the collection of all space times up to different morphism. Can you classify them using representations of a, of a certain uh, algebra up to unitary equivalence? Well, these sort of questions are precisely questions that one considers nowadays in invariant descriptive set theory. And there is the whole complexity hierarchy uh, that people study in descriptive set theory, that this complexity hierarchy then seems to me that may be also relevant for uh, figuring out which quantization recipes uh, may be applied uh, uh, in gravity. So maybe, maybe I'll stop here. Uh, thanks a lot for listening and let me know if you have any questions. So thanks again for the very interesting talk. Um, yeah, do we have any questions from the participants? Not. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, one brief one that I've got still comes back to the, the linearized, to linearized gravity. So just to clarify, that is fully an open question whether it um whether there is an incompleteness theorem in the linearized. Oh, sorry. Uh, the... As of now, it's open. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cool. As of now, it's open. Hmm. Yeah, cool. Um, unless we so have... I've got a question. I've got a question. Hi, Nick. Hello. Hey. Hi. Um, nice talk. Um, so I was wondering, how much do your incompleteness results rely on the formal smoothness um, of GR? Uh -huh, and uh -huh, in, uh -huh. in, let, let, me, let me be a little more specific, because um, I, I tend to find that when mathematicians say, oh, something works for arbitrarily large but finite but fails for infinite it usually means that, that that difference is either not observable or not practically observable like like what are the physical significance what is the physical significance to your result that's a slightly different question but kind of related right so i'll say that uh, the result doesn't rely on smoothness in the sense that if we don't have if even if we didn't have smoothness it will be more easy for us to prove Incompleteness, meaning uh, it will be if you if you if we if you if we allow if we remove the smoothness assumption and we allow space times that are not smooth as well, it's, it is even more easy for us to cook up pathological situations. So somehow, really, smoothness is is a restriction that makes it more difficult for us to prove the result, the incompleteness result. 
I see. Um, um, however, uh, what is the physical significance of that, of, the, of these results? Uh, maybe Marius can, may, ha may have something to say here. What I, what I will say is that um, it's not clear to me if you, for example, what we really are using here is we're, we're using some uh, pathologies which are asymptotic to, towards infinity. So we we'll, we'll use these fluctuations that go all the way to infinity. If you don't allow right. these fluctuations all the way, so somehow we use this, uh, patholo this asymptotic, as asymptotic pathology in the asymptotic behavior, this is what we're using. That being said, it's not clear to me yet. Right. So, so here's a question. The question is, does there exist, can, can you prove a similar in Goblinder's theorem within the realm of asymptotically flat space times? This is open. And I think, I think that, uh, that might be towards the direction you're asking about the yeah, that is relevance. Actually, yeah, because we already know that there's weird pathologies with the Hilbert Hotel and, you know, shifting infinite sets and all that. You know, because countable infinity contains itself plus extra stuff. And, and you know, you get weird pathologies that way. Um, so your infinite shifting uh, being required, I would see how that could introduce some incompleteness. I think, yeah, um, that's a that's a very good point. Now, with this plane wake solution, can you just say a little bit more about that? Uh, like, yeah. what, what is it? Is it just a typical uh, single particle excitation, or is it some some so other? So this is thing? okay. Let me go back to the. Let me go back to this. Uh, sorry, I don't know what this. Is. Oh, okay, here. So, so this plane waves. In some sense, are the most simple, the most simple uh, vacuum solutions you have, uh, smoothly defined over over R four, which are not flat in a certain sense. So, meaning the most simple in a certain sense that are not flat. I mean, this this includes the flat solution right. because you can take uh, you can take h to be zero. Um, so, one one reason that this uh, this uh, plane waves are very important is the following. So if, if you are if you are in a Lorentzian manifold and you give me a point inside this manifold, if you go very very close to it, asymptotically this looks like the tangent plane. So it looks it looks at the flat Minkowski, very very close to it. Now do the same thing, but instead of a point, take the the manifold M and take take a line, take a like a time like line for example, and try to approximate this line. Come close, uh, approx approximate. Uh, up to up to first approximation, this line, what you'll get as, is is a is a plane wave. So plane waves are somehow the asymptotic limits around uh, around uh, time like orbits in in a in a Lorentzian manifold and vice versa. So somehow somehow it the same way that flat space time approximates point uh, the tangent space around point. Plane waves are precisely the things that approximate uh, um, geodesics. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. I and, think, uh, uh, in this discussion, maybe. Um, who is the person asking? What's his name? Nick. Yeah, I'm Nick Minakuchi. I'm a professor at MIT. Yeah. All right. So, look, I am a, you know, poor physicist. And I feel when you say, you know, wait a minute, is this some mathematical weird thing? Do we need to care about it? Um, look, I mean, first of all, this is um, a serious issue of the full theory. Then we can discuss whether you want to replace general relativity with some other theory, which is an option. But if you want to keep general relativity, which happens to be one of the main pillars of physics that has been extensively verified by experiment, it does not have complete observables. Um, that's pretty much it. It doesn't depend on any yeah. weird, how to say, uh, choice of smoothness of the solutions or anything of that type. Now, the way he uses this solution, the plane waves, is um, how to say, um, you simply need to show that there is one type of the solutions in your space of solutions. And then the entire space of solutions has a problem. Now, one way to go around that would be to excise this type of solutions. But again, then you're not talking about the same theory. And it's not obvious that you can in any way excise 
plane waves from GR and still have local degrees of freedom because these are not the plane waves of linearized uh, gravity. They're a much more general uh, family. Essentially, you would be trying to make GR something that is not the uh, GR. Um, maybe one way to go around it is, as uh, Aristoteles is saying, would be to uh, change general relativity with another theory where you have imposed that you have asymptotic flatness, which of course would not uh, give you many, many uh, solutions that are physically interesting. Uh, but still, I mean, maybe in that case, you could still do some asymptotic quantization or something. Um, another thing you could do is confine yourself to compact manifolds and hope that this uh, uh, goes away. Now, how much do we care as physicists? Well, I mean, it doesn't change how successful general relativity is as a, as a physical theory, um, but it does give an answer to the following question. It's been basically 100 years, people have been going around this story of observables. Um, because it's an obvious thing to wish for, to have them, and they've not been finding them. Um, and there has been a discussion of uh, what is it that we need to do to find them. And this just gives you a clear answer that in the full theory, you can't have them, basically. Um, and then you need to see what uh, you want to do with that. Do you want to restrict the theory to some sector where maybe you have them or not? or you just uh, forget about uh, uh, observables of this kind. It's something like that, the content of what is in here. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. Um, sorry for the noise, I'm outside. But um, I I take your point fully in that the, the result as a mathematical theorem is very important. I, I tend to look at it like other incompleteness theorems, um, Gödel's and also say Rice's theorem in computer science. It says that even if you have the source code of a program, you cannot always tell what it's going to do. In fact, most in fact, most programs you can't tell what they're going to do. And yet we're able to program and we're able to analyze code. And so I'm not disparaging this result at all. I think it's really important and I think it's really good. I think more, I'm I'm actually more interested in are there any observable effects that could be seen or ways to poke this where um, what is hidden in the infinities here might be seen if you tweak it somehow. Anyway, I'm, I'm much more optimistic and I'm not disparaging at all. Um, I realize some people might ask that question like, well, what are there any physical consequences as a way to say, what's the point? I'm not actually saying what's the point. I get the point. I think it's very important. But I am just wondering um, whether there's anything more physical. And I, I do think you answered that, especially with the asymptotically flat. And um, could you excise these things or what would it look like? I mean, I think those are important avenues. But I really like the result that says that there's an incompleteness here, just like there is in a lot of other areas of, um, of science, which is great. I like it. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Cool, thank you. Um, in fact, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say one other thing. The Rice's theorem, the, the inability to figure out what a program does, even when you have source code is actually kind of important conceptually when you're talking about AI, at least in my opinion, uh, that you may know exactly what the weights are in your large language model, but that doesn't mean that you can predict exactly what it's going to do in the future. And I think that concepts like that have become useful in surprising ways. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, there may be something similar here. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, sorry if I was too defensive, I didn't mean to be just uh, defending my mathematician friend. Um, I'm on board with, I support him too, man. <laughs> Thanks so, for creating a safe space for mathematicians. <laughs> so, um, look, one way to think about it, I mean, look, we all have our convictions. Personally, I think that the uh, the continuum or the infinity, if you want, is an approximation to um, the discrete and the finite. And I think the world is discrete and finite. Uh, you know, whatever, theologically, I believe. I mean, um, but even if I am taking this position, you still uh, need the infinite and the continuum because it actually 
simplifies things, right? You don't want to have a zillion difference equations that you have to solve. You prefer to have one differential equation. And so one way to read uh, this is to ask, telling you that if you're going to try to work with a field theory, a classical field theory to describe gravity, that is going to have also general covariance, you're going to, uh, that's the way you want to describe the world, you're going to have this problem. And uh, of course, if you make it finite and discrete, imagine that you use regular calculus in a, on a compact manifold instead of GR, and you say, well, that's, mm -hmm. that's GR to arbitrary precision, fine, uh, but then this is going to be a much more complicated um, beast to deal with. So I think what th this theorem does is, is showing you a trade-off somehow, that you can go to the infinite and all this stuff, but then you might uh, fall into incompleteness uh, problems. You can get rid of the incompleteness problems if you stay in the finite and the discrete, but then you're not gonna be able to use analysis which uh, helps you do calculations. It's, I mean, I think there's gonna be, you know, it has to be demarcated much more clearly in the future, but I think this is how I think of this work is just somehow showing you the trade-offs between uh, going, uh, you know, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. and then, like I was saying, you get this kind of the trade offs. Like, if you use a different type of logic to define your programming, well, if you use intuitionistic logic, use logic where you don't have a lot of the excluded middle. So, you so either you have a constructive proof or you don't have a proof, there's no proof by contradiction or any of these things, then you don't have those pathologies. But if we want more powerful logics, then we end up with things like um, the, uh, then you end up with incompleteness. And so mm -hmm. that might be kind of like what you're saying, but if you want to extend this to the continuum, then, yes. and, and actually use real GR, then yeah, you're going to have to deal with this sort of thing. So yeah, kind of like that too. Nice. Yes, I, I think it's like that, that uh, Aristos also think about that somehow, this is trying to tell you something about the language that uh, there are trade-offs. You can go and use a much more powerful language, but you're gonna lose some aspects of computability or explicit description. Then what is the good thing to do? I think that's the kind of discussion that can be had based on such results. Um, personally, I'm not that absolutist. I don't think you should do one thing or the other. You need to understand what are the trade-offs and see where you can use uh, one or the other. And yeah, you cannot do everything yeah. with, uh, with, uh, with one <laughs> tool, basically. And this is one yeah. thing you cannot do with uh, a classical field theory that has uh, general covariance and no conditions on uh, what the solutions would be. You get incompleteness. I mean, that's the, that's the message. How far this incompleteness yeah, that's... very interesting, I think, to, to, to uncover. I mean, if you also have incompleteness in compact manifolds and asymptotically flat manifolds, it's a much more serious problem, for sure. So Nick, Nick and I, and I Nick, Nick call as well, well Nick, um, to distinguish. And uh, Nick and I have been working in uh, but especially if you look at uh, uh, covariance, um, variant limitation to base times. And in JPOD, I looked at this in the past as well. And in the case, you, uh, so the idea comes from sampling theory that and kind of a, a rather old band limit on the signal. You can reconstruct the signal perfectly from discrete samples of um, that just chance. But um, in the covariant case, you get some weird behavior, and you can conduct it with discrete samples of points in space-time, but you can with, say, um, lines through space-time or planes. So the, that's kind of why I'm interested in whether this was a mathematical artifact where I have to... Dropped out a bit there. Mm -hmm. um, was I the only one who couldn't understand him? No, I think it was, I've heard it pretty scattered as well. Okay. Yeah, we couldn't hear, it was very cut off. Um... Mm. 
but just briefly chime in on something you were just mentioning uh, about um uh, oh hang on i'll let nick okay i don't know what happened there. but anyway i hope that there it, when you put restrictions on um space time you can end up having um you can end up allowing space time to be discoverable by a smooth fold or by more extra lower uh, sequence of more lower dimensional structures. And in that case, it'd be interesting to see whether you'll have incompleteness, et cetera. Nick, I think I've missed part of what you said because uh, there are some interruptions. Uh, but can you repeat the last sentence? Where, where, where do you think it's uh, inter what is interesting? Uh, you said something about at the end. Just a minute here. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll say it. Um, Basically, what we're what we're doing here is looking at um sort of cutoff theories. So we're sampling sampling field theories and also trying to do a bit of sampling on or possibly on a, on a manifold of sorts. And so one of our considerations with respect to your work might be when you have a a manifold described by such a sampling theory then maybe such a manifold would fall into the set of into the set where you might actually have observables and um I see. These, uh, uh, an example of where a physical system would provide observables rather than uh, just mathematical solutions which, which forbid them Uh, this uh, terminology sampling theory and cutoff theories appeared recently. Someone told me about this recently. So it's something that I maybe I should uh, take a look at. Um, cool. Yeah. So it's, um, I think, um, for the purposes of GR manifolds, um, Covariant sampling or covariant cutoff theories would be the relevant ones, but uh, they're very uh, premature. Let's put it that way um, mm. at the moment. Mm. But it might be worth a look. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Cool. So yeah, I think that was a great talk, though. But... Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was really, really Thank you. interesting. Um, so if we don't have any more questions, we'll wrap up there for today. Um, thanks again for coming to give the to give the talk. And um, we'll also, if you're fine with this recording being posted on YouTube as well. Um, Sounds good. Thanks a lot yeah. for inviting me. And no uh, I look forward to attending again. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone.